earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, and sometimes when you read it, you don't realize the progression that has taken place. Um, there's a group of people following the Lord, and there's a lot of curiosity and certainly a lot of amazement as people watch Him do the miracles that He's doing and listen to the things that He's teaching. But when it comes to genuine faith that Jesus is the Messiah that the Old Testament promised, uh, between actually putting their faith that He is the Messiah and, and to do that, he, they would have to oppose the religious leaders because they're following Christ around now and trying to... Uh, disrupt the ministry of Jesus Christ and anyone who would believe on Jesus Christ is going to have to go against the grain, go against the religious leaders and as a result of that there really is only a remnant that are really true believers in Christ. So there's a lot of group of people following and uh, more out of curiosity and, uh, and what we've seen so far in our study is that even though like Matthew, Mark and Luke cover the Galilean, the northern ministry of Christ, uh, John keeps reminding us when you read the Gospel of John that every, you know, holy day that Israel had to, to go down to Jerusalem, Jesus Christ has a ministry down in Judea. John covers that Judean ministry, but the point is, is at this point already in the ministry of Jesus Christ, he, he's like two years into his ministry, he only had a three, three and a half year long ministry, and uh, at this point he's already been rejected in Judea, but also in Galilee where he was from and where he did the most teaching. And, uh, and so now he's preparing. Last time we saw him preparing his disciples, telling them that when he gets to Jerusalem he's going to die, and, and then also preparing them that they're going to have to take up their cross and follow him because the pressure is going to become even greater. Uh, in chapter 8, verse 31, it says, And he began to teach them, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Now that word begin, they, they, none of the message so far has been anything about him dying. They look at him as coming to be the fulfillment of the Old Testament and the ultimate fulfillment is that he's going to set up a kingdom there. He's going to be their king and set, establish the throne of David in Jerusalem and reign forever and ever. So that they don't understand that there's a first coming and a second coming. They're got, the things they're preaching, the things they're looking forward to is that ultimate goal. And so they're preaching the good news that the kingdom of heaven's at hand. But now he's preparing them. His ministry has been rejected. He's going to go. He's going to die. He tells them that. Peter rebukes him. He has no understanding of this. You'll see it even in chapter 9 a couple times. But in chapter, in chapter 8, verse 34, not only does he say he's going to die, he says in verse 34, when he called his people unto him and with his disciples also, he said unto them, whatsoever, uh, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So there's going to be those followers of Christ are going to suffer persecution. And so he's preparing them for that as his ministry is rejected and, and his death is imminent. He's not going to be long until uh, he is crucified. So when you come to Mark chapter 9 now, what, he's going, what you're going to see throughout this chapter is him preparing his apostles for their ministry during the time of his absence. Now, if you look at chapter 9, we won't read through all the details. I just kind of want to show you that there's four events that we're going to look at through chapter 9. And, and I'm going to tell you ahead of time so that when you see these things, you might have a little bit more understanding of what the events are there for. Uh, in chapter 9, verses 1 through 13, this is known as the Mount of Transfiguration. The Lord is going to show what it's like, what He's going to be like in His second coming. So he, it's called the Mount of Transfiguration. You'll see in a minute when we break it down further that there's really two parts to that. But the very fact that he's going to show them his coming and glory, you can see that what he's going to do to prepare them for the ministry, he's going to set the hope before them. They're going to see the end before it comes to prepare them for the ministry uh, that, they're, that they're going to have to go through. And, and then part of the other things that they're going to learn about here is there's going to be before he comes back, there's going to be uh, a time of persecution, uh, well, a time of apostasy. Uh, then after that, in verses uh, 14 through 29, uh, uh, something that's always bothered me, it's where he's already given his apostles authority to cast out demons and to do the miracles and so forth, and they, they've gone out and done them. And, uh, and yet, when verses 14 through uh, 
29, it's a long incident here where a, a person, a man, a, a boy that had a dumb and a deaf spirit, so powerful the apostles couldn't cast him out. And uh, then the Lord actually asked the man, how long this kid had this? And then the Lord finally casts him out, but the demon just does all kinds of things to this guy before he comes out. And then the apostles naturally asked the question, how come we couldn't do it? And he says, you couldn't, because this kind doesn't come out except for by prayer and fasting. And so the demon cast out of this person. And when you study that, what you're going to see in that is the power of the enemy and the only one who can really overcome him. And, uh, and, and so we'll see that. That's the second incident. The third is real short, verses 30 through 32, where it's his last pass through of Galilee. And as he's going through, he, he is, uh, um, he, he's going to go through unannounced, but he's going to be explaining again about his death when he gets to Jerusalem. And uh, again, there's one of those times where he explains and the apostles don't get it. And then in verses 33 through 50, he's going to bring a child uh, before, before them, and he's going to give lessons in ministry using children. And uh, uh, it, to me, when I look at that, it, it, there's, a, there's a statement made in the book of Matthew about being wise as serpent and harmless as doves. And certainly when he brings those children in, he's going to emphasize the ministry of being harmless as a dove in the sense that they're not to be lords, but they're to be servants. They're not to judge uh, they leave that to the Lord. They're not to be offensive. And, and those are the three things that he's going to teach them in that section. So uh, each one of those, as you see here, he's preparing them for ministry and what they're going to face in his absence. He's actually going to go away and their ministry is going to continue. And he prepares them for what they're going to be facing during that time and, and, and how to minister. Now, going back to the beginning here, let me read the first 13 verses. And even though we're only going to cover probably one through three today, this is called the Mount of Transfiguration, and I want you to have at least the details in your mind. Mark 9, 1, it says, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There shall be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them into a high mountain apart by themselves, and, and he was transfigured before them, and his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so, so as no fuller on earth can, can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias and Moses, now that's Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus, and Peter said, uh, answered and said to, to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Uh, for, wa, for he was, was, was not, <laughs> knew not what to say, for they uh, were so afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked around about, they saw no man any more save Jesus only with themselves. And as they came down from the mount, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were raised from the dead." And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another uh, what, what the rising from the dead should mean. And they answered him, saying, Why say the scribes and, uh, uh, that Elias must first, uh, must first come? And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first, and restoreth all things, and how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. Now, that section, you got the, what I, I just called it all the Mount of Transfiguration. We could have kind of divided it up, but it divides itself up into two sections, because all of it, they go up to the Mount, and by the end of verse 13, they're coming down the Mount, and it's the conversation on the way down that the second section centers around. But those, there's two lessons there. And those two lessons are divided by that elusive statement that Christ keeps making. Not elusive to us, but elusive to the apostles. And that is what you see there uh, in verse 9 and 10. It says, again, And as they came down from the mount, 
he charged them that they should tell no man the things that they had seen. They just saw the Mount of Transfiguration. They've seen him transfigured before their eyes. Don't tell anybody what you just saw till the Son of Man were raised from the dead. And they kept that saying within themselves, questioning one with another what the raising from the dead should mean. <laughs> now, you know, it's amazing because the gospel we preach, gospel means good news, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the message God wants the world to know today. If you, if, well, Oscar Woodall used to say when he met a stranger, you'd introduce him, he would not know you at all, hello, how you do? Instead of asking, what do you do for a living, all the rest, he would wait maybe two minutes into a conversation, and he says, you know, I don't want to talk to anybody very long until I know whether or not you know if you were to die today, whether you'd spend eternity with God, eternity in heaven. And if you don't know, would you like to know if you could know? And, and Oscar was just a real guy that just gave the gospel to everyone he met, and, uh, and very persistent and consistent at it. And, uh, but, but the good news that he would share with that person is you can know that you can have eternal life. It's a free gift, bought and paid for already, because the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world and died on the cross for sinners, was buried and rose again to give us eternal life. And whosoever believes that he died for their sins and rose again, God gives them a gift of eternal life. It's God's gift when you just trust the payment that Christ made in your behalf. He was your substitute paying for your sins. That's what God wants you to trust in. Now, that, that's the good news that God would want everyone to know. And if you would have two minutes with someone and you could only spend two minutes with them, that'd be the one thing you'd want to leave them with. But that's not the message in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You realize that. Because <laughs> here, we already read over there in chapter 8, he tells him he's going to die and Peter rebukes him. No, that's not going to happen to you. And then here he comes down from the mountain. Now he's told them, I'm going to die when I get to Jerusalem and rise again the third day. So he says, now, what you just saw, don't tell any man and, until I'm risen from the dead. And they go, what? What in the world is he talking about, risen from the dead? They have no idea that he's going to die and rise again. And so just take the things after that. Once he rises again, he's going to send back into heaven. And then he's going to come a second time and then fulfill all the promises that were made. He couldn't fulfill the promises until there's a payment made for sin. Israel's program hinges on the cross, just like our salvation hinges on the cross. So that had to be done, and, and so they, at this point, they don't understand that. But in, in the story about the Mount of Transfiguration, you have an incident that takes place before that statement, and then an incident that takes place after that statement. And so we'll kind of study it both ways like that and realize how that's the pivotal point uh, of everything. Uh, but prior to the statement, they have a vision of Jesus Christ coming into the kingdom, and then afterwards they have that conversation about the uh, future ministry of Elijah, and why? Why is there a future ministry of Elijah? And uh, that will kind of Im involve what their ministry is going to be like, and the condition of Israel, and so forth. But, but uh, we'll deal with the first part first. Prior to the, the statement there, the, the Mount of Transfiguration. Notice, it, first of all, in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, but before I read it, get Matthew chapter 16. Actually, if you get Matthew 17, you'll see why I'm saying it that way. Just have that one handy there. Now, you, now, first of all, Mark chapter 9, verse 1, you have to realize what a startling statement this is. Chapter 9, verse 1, And he said unto them, Verily, now that's truly, I say unto you, that there shall be some of them that stand here which shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. Now, I've just talked all about the cross, how that's not the message. That's our message today, the cross work of Christ. But they're seeing Christ coming as to fulfill all the promises to the nation of Israel, and what they're preaching is the good news of the kingdom. The good news of the kingdom is the king is here, and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Prophetically speaking, according to the prophets, even though Christ is preparing that he's going to go away and come back, there's not going to be a long time between the two. 
prophetically speaking. The timeline has been set, and that's not going to be much time between those two. And so for him to say, I'm telling you, truly, there's some standing here that's not going to taste death till they see the Son of Man come in, in, in power and glory. And you realize, you're preaching, you're telling people the kingdom is at hand, and then he tells you that. Can you imagine how excited that would be? Oh, wow, someone, it's, you know, it's, it's in my lifetime, it's coming soon. And, and so that, that's quite a startling statement. Um, but the statement is divided by a, a, a break in, in, in Matthew chapter 16. Look at, look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 28. And, and it always bothered me, you know, Mark does, I always looked at Matthew and, and wondered why someone would put a chapter division at verse, at between verse 28 of chapter 16 and chapter 17, verse 1. And I always use the joke about the guy riding on the back of a camel when he did this and his pen just jumped down and... <laughs> uh, and, and I, but, but now I, for the first time, can understand some of, the, some of the reason why. In verse 28 of Matthew 16, it says, Verily I say unto you, there shall some, some standing here, which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And after six days, Jesus take Peter, James, and John, and they're going to see it, right? But see, in Matthew, it's divided there, as if, What's said in verse 28 isn't connected with what's said in chapter 17. It is. You know it is because that's when it gets fulfilled. But uh, in Mark, there's, there's not a, uh, a chapter division there. But at the same time, if you look at Mark chapter 9, it says after he makes that statement that, that some will see the, the kingdom of God come with power, verse 2 says, and after six days Jesus taketh with him. So both of them have that statement afterwards. Uh, that uh, He makes that statement, and then it's like six days later, maybe even a little longer, but, but it's after six days that, that that transpires. And so there is a division between the statement and the time that it's fulfilled. And, uh, and, and so that's why Matthew would put that division in there by a chapter break. Mark just runs them together so that you see the fulfillment of that. But... Uh, but there's a standalone statement there that, that some aren't going to taste death till they see the kingdom come. And so there's a, a real excitement about that and, and realization that it's at hand. Uh, you know what you know from that, by the way? These people have no understanding or hint, anticipation of a 2,000 year gap between the first coming and the second coming of Jesus Christ. I mean... I mean, that just stands there, and, and you know, that's kind of like what, what I'm saying about the gap in verse, in how Matthew separates it. If it wasn't for a pre, prelude to the kingdom that's going to come in six days later, uh, there's a gap between his first coming and his second coming. And uh, there's a prophetic gap there, by the way. Not, not that you have to introduce the mystery. There's a prophetic gap. He's going to go away, and a delay is coming, and then he's going to come back. But the 2,000-year gap is explained by the Apostle Paul in your Bible. It, it's the reason that you're sitting here today. Because God has turned to the Gentiles and opened up a whole new dispensation. Because he doesn't want any to perish. He wants all to be saved. And the message today centers around the cross. And because of the cross work of Christ, God can be gracious to this world before he judges it. He will judge it. But the cross is the means by God could distribute grace and offer salvation as a free gift, and not just to the nation of Israel, to all nations. So that's what the age of grace is all about. That wasn't known back here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And certainly as you read this section, you realize there's no anticipation of a gap of time between uh, the, the coming of that kingdom. But, but note, there's something else there that just stood out to me. Uh, in, in Mark 9, when it says, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There shall not be... There shall so, there shall be some, so it's not all, there shall be some of them that stand here which shall not taste death till. Now that, that all, I never saw that word till like that before. Till they see the kingdom of God come with power. What, doesn't that imply that after they see the kingdom they'll die afterwards? See, if it was the anticipation of the kingdom coming... Well, the kingdom is when the first resurrection takes place. 
So the people who will be there, be alive through the end of that tribulation when God judges the world and Jesus Christ comes that second time, the people who are alive and Jesus Christ comes back, they enter into the kingdom, they enter into life. They don't just see it till they die. <laughs> they see it and never die. But he's saying to them something quite different, that there's going to be some that are going to see it and then die afterwards. So that's not really the kingdom coming, that's a prelude to the kingdom. They're going to see a vision of the kingdom coming, and then they'll, they'll see death afterwards. And the sum, we know in verse 2, he takes, uh, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John. That's the sum. And they're going to see it, and they're going to die after they see this kingdom. So, you know, they, they have died. Uh, so, so one of the things that we know is that this is actually a, a prefigure. They're going to get to see the kingdom coming, and uh, they're going to get a preview of what, what it's like when that kingdom comes. Now, in verse 2, when it says, And after six days Jesus take with him Peter and James and John, and led them into the mount apart by themselves, and was transfigured before them. Now, he's going to... There's going to be a transformation that's going to take place. He's up on this mount. A mount always in your Bible represents a kingdom and a throne. He's going to reign on Mount Zion. I'm not sure what mountain this is. We just call it the Mount of Transfiguration. But he goes up on this mount, and it, all of a sudden he's transformed from his earthly appearance to his radiant glory that he's going to come back in the second coming. Now, he takes Peter, James, and John. Interestingly, Mark 9, verse 2 says, After six days Jesus taketh with him those people. So he said, Some are going to see death till this happens, and six days later it happens. Actually, it says after six days, doesn't it? Matthew says, uh, in verse chapter 17, verse 1, you don't have to look at it, it just says, After six days Jesus take with him and the same three, three men. But look over in Luke chapter 9. person called me this week and he's witnessing to a man at work and the man at work says, oh, the Bible's full of contradictions. And he, so they agreed to sit down and talk about these contradictions. There's a, there's a lot of seeming contradictions in the Bible. Just kind of things people, that, well, I know God just put them there because if people don't want to believe God's word, then they can just find these and make up an excuse not to believe God's word. But if you'll study God's word, there's no contradictions in the Bible. Amen. Uh, uh, Matthew, uh, Luke chapter 9 and verse 26, the same incident takes place, and it says, no, I just dropped to verse 27, it says, and I tell you the truth, there will be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God, and it came to pass about, an, uh, uh, came, came to pass about an eight, eight days after that saying, that he took Peter and John and, uh, and James unto the mount to pray. And then he goes, his fashion changes as you read down there. So here it says, it came to pass about an eight days. Over there it said, after six days. So is it about eight days or is it after six days? Well, yeah, you can say, I mean, that just stands by itself. But you know, this also helps you do some timing. A lot of times dates in the Bible you get a little bit mixed up on. Think about this. If, say, we don't know what day it was. Say it was Sunday. What is after six days after Sunday? Well, if it's Sunday and it's after Monday, after Tuesday, after Wednesday, after Thursday, after Friday, after Saturday, what would be that day after? What's the day after Saturday? Sunday. Sunday. Say he said this on Sunday in about eight days. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Just depends which way you say it, right? You know, you have the exact... The reason that's important, you have verses that say Jesus said he's going to die and be raised again on the third day. And you have other verses that say after three days he'll rise again. Now, which is it? Are you going to rise the third day or rise after the third day? Well, it depends where you start counting, doesn't it? He, he died on Thursday, so he, there's Friday, Saturday, he rose Sunday. If you count Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, he rose after the third day. 
<laughs> so so it, it's, it's the same. But that's the answer to that in case people say, oh, see, there's contradictions in the Bible. And sometimes, you, yeah, how can he raise after the third day and on the third day? Well, we do it all the time. And, uh, you know, the way, when we talk about certain dates and we've got to figure out we count today or don't count today and so forth. So anyhow, it, it just... Another one of those things sitting there in, in your Bible. And, and, uh, and, but you knew the answer right from the beginning. Certainly eight days is after six days. <laughs> so no problem there. Uh, but anyhow, he takes them to the mount and, and is transfigured before them. Um, there's something else I'm going to show you from Luke. Well... The transfiguration part. Boy, I don't know. Um, I already explained that trans, transfiguration, when he's transformed, uh, the, the book of Luke says uh, in verse 9 and verse uh, 29, it says, And as he prayed, his fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. So when he's transformed, the reason it's called the Mount of Transfiguration in Mark chapter 9 and verse 3, it says, and his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow. The Lord Jesus Christ was God manifested in the flesh, but the Bible says he came, now listen to this, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. See, your flesh doesn't radiate. We're sinners. When Jesus Christ came, his flesh didn't radiate. He didn't have sinful flesh. He wasn't sinful. But he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. So he looked just like everybody else. But when he went to that Mount of Transfiguration, what he allowed is the glory that's behind that flesh of who he really is began to shine out of his body. And he was transfigured, transformed. The glory from within shined out and they saw Jesus Christ as he will be. I'll show you next week the verses at his second coming, when he comes back in power and glory. I just close with this. Is It says there, after the end of verse 3, so that no fuller on earth can wipe them. Mark writes, no one else says that but Mark. Mark is writing, a, and he's writing as a servant. And he's thinking, you know, there's not a servant, there's not a fuller, there's not a dry cleaner that could ever wipe his raiment the way he was shining when they saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration. And that's just one of those things that show the, the personality of the writer and how God uses that person to reveal divine truth to us. Now, this is Donut Sunday, so enjoy coffee and donuts. We'll start again at 11 o'clock for the family worship time. And uh, in the meantime, enjoy your fellowship one with another. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the class. And we thank you for these special Sundays, too, where we can spend a little bit of relaxing time one with another and pray that it might be meaningful and helpful. And, and, uh, and Father, help us to even discuss the scriptures, the things that we saw, didn't see, learned, didn't, didn't learn in, in the lesson just now. So we, we thank you again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>